Well, I've been a big fan of vintage Epiphones since the 60s when they were new guitars. <laughs> now, the modern Epiphone company has made models that recall those great guitars for decades. But not many were especially accurate until those 50th anniversary models from 2012. Now, those were a big step in the right direction, if you ask me, as were the reissue solid bodies of 2020. Well, then in 2023, for their 150th anniversary, Epiphone introduced four new vintage reissues, including today's guitar, the 150th anniversary Sheraton. Now, I've long felt Epiphone's original Sheraton was one of the most beautiful semi-hollows ever made. Now, when the original model debuted in 1958 alongside the Gibson ES-335, it was the fanciest semi-hollow Gibson made at the time. Now, it's no accident that much of the visual appeal was carried over from the original New York Epiphone Company, such as the headstock with the Tree of Life inlay and the V-Block fingerboard inlays. Now, this was because when Gibson bought Epiphone in 1957, they received all the leftover parts, including complete necks, pickups, bodies, frequentator tailpieces, and so on. Now, Gibson made use of those original New York parts when building the first Kalamazoo Epiphones. And in my opinion, combining the original necks with the new thin line body resulted in a real looker. Now, the very earliest examples even had leftover New York pickups which not everyone realizes were actually single coils. But Gibson ran out of those before long, and rather than just use the same humbuckers that went into Gibson-branded models, the mini humbucker was developed in order to keep Epiphone models distinctly different. In fact, they weren't used on Gibsons until Norlin decided to move Epiphone production overseas. Now, Gibson was left with a surplus of the pickups, and the Les Paul Deluxe was born. Now, some of you are thinking, what about the Firebird? Well, Firebird pickups look similar, but are actually a very different design than the Epiphone Mini Humbucker. So looking this over, other than some small manufacturing details, they got most of it right. Plus, it has Gibson USA pickups. Rather than the frequencer tailpiece that's used on the current standard Sheraton model, for this limited anniversary model, they've opted for the Epiphone Trimitone Vibrato, which is also historically correct, as it was an option in the 60s. Now, like a Bigsby, these were designed for gentle vibrato, not crazy whammy bar antics. And it works quite well. In fact, tuning stability is way better than I expected. <laughs> Now, this guitar is quite nicely put together and finished. The gloss finish is poly, of course, but it doesn't look or feel cheap at all. It seems reasonably thin and shows off the wood grain nicely. Now, the inlays and multiply binding are all beautifully done. I love the effort that's been made to replicate the original binding. They're actually using 7-ply binding on the top of the body, 4-ply on the back, and 3-ply on the headstock. Now, I imagine it would have been simpler to just use the same thing everywhere. So making the effort shows a level of pride in Epiphone's heritage that's impressive and gratifying. Now, this Sheraton appears to be based on an early 60s model and has a slim 60s style neck. And like other recent top-of-the-line Epiphones, it's a one-piece neck. Now, of course, it's the usual Gibson 24.75-inch scale length and 12-inch fingerboard radius. Now, the inlays are Mother of Pearl and Abalone, which is great. But I do think Epiphone should use rosewood fingerboards for these premium models. Still, there's nothing really wrong with the Indian Laurel board. 
And by the way, if you'd like to know how to darken the laurel and make it look more like a beautiful vintage fingerboard, well, check out my recent video on upgrading the Epiphone ES335 Traditional Pro. Now, the frets are listed as medium jumbo, which has become a catch-all term manufacturers seem to use to cover everything that's neither super skinny nor super fat. <laughs> now, these frets are fairly narrow, like 50s frets, not short and wide like so many frets you see on later 60s Gibsons. Now, the nut width is the popular 1 and 11 16th inch, or 43 millimeters, rather than the narrow ones Gibson and Epiphone went to in about 65. This plays quite nice. Though again, like so many guitars built in Asian factories, the fret ends are just a little rough and could use some attention with the fret end dressing file. Now they're not too bad, but they are scratchy enough to be a little bit distracting. And I'll say it again, it's not hard to fix. And with the company doing so much right, it would really be in their best interest to focus a bit more on this area of production. Now, fretwork in general is the single most important factor in the playability of a guitar, especially the leveling and crowning. But because it's somewhat labor-intensive, it's invariably where so many new guitars fall short. Still, that aside, this is an impressive recreation of one of my favorite vintage guitars. Eh, it's not cheap, but let's face it. If it were made in Gibson's USA factory as it was originally... It'd probably be three to six times the price at least. And thought of that way, well, the price doesn't seem so steep. Now, this guitar sells for the exact same $1,299 as the Inspired by Gibson Custom ES355 I featured a couple of weeks ago. Now, the two guitars have a number of things in common, as well as some important differences. In fact, it seems to make sense to do a direct comparison, so keep an eye out for that in the next few weeks. Well, as always, if you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't yet. And of course, if you'd like to further support the channel and help me keep making these videos, consider becoming a Patreon member. And with that, I'll say goodbye for now, and I'll see you again very soon.